Well, hello there and welcome to another exciting episode of Secrets to Real Estate Investing by House Flip Masters. Today we have a really interesting guest and a new topic for our podcast that we have not yet covered. So I'm really excited to bring that to you, my listeners. Our guest today is none other than Joe Fairless. Joe is the host of the world's longest running daily real estate podcast. Great show. I've heard quite a few episodes and learned some great advice on it. His show is called Best Real Estate Investing Advice Ever. Clever topic. Love that. <laughs> he began in New York City as the youngest vice president of an advertising agency to creating a company that now controls over $54 million worth of real estate. Very impressive. Joe's podcasts Hosts distinguished real estate investors and entrepreneurs to share their advice and success stories. Some of his past guests include Barbara Corcoran and Robert Kiyosaki. Very excellent real estate investors, if I may say so myself. He's got a great book, and I'm sure he'll talk about that. And um, with that, I want to say welcome to you, Joe. Thanks for being with us. Oh, thank you so much. Looking forward to our conversation. All right. Well, for those listeners that have not known about you or met you or heard about you. Give us a little bit of background on how you started and how you ended up where you're at today. Well, first off, if they don't know about me or heard about me, then, then shame on them. I mean, come on. No. I know. Really? <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm, I'm totally kidding. Uh, my background, really quickly, I am from Texas originally, went to Texas Tech University, graduated in 2005. I moved straight to New York City right after that. I, my major was advertising. I worked at a prestigious advertising agency on Madison Avenue, which also means that I didn't make any money at all because, <laughs> because I was uh, working for probably less than minimum wage when you factor in the hours that I was working. But I was climbing the corporate ladder relatively quickly, and after about six years, I ended up becoming the youngest vice president of a New York City advertising agency. Just I wasn't digging it at that point wasn't fulfilled. I'm a huge Tony Robbins fan and he talks about the human needs and two of them lead to fulfillment, growth and contribution. I didn't feel like I was growing and I didn't feel like what I was doing was contributing in a meaningful way. Therefore, while I had my full-time job in advertising, I was also investing on the side and teaching classes and teaching people how to do what I was doing, which at the time was buying single family homes in Dallas, Texas, Dallas, Fort Worth, where I'm originally from. I saw that that was made a lot of sense, but I also saw it was taking a whole long, long period of time to get to where I wanted to be because I was making about 250 bucks per, per house. And I had four of them at, uh, once I got done buying homes. So it was what, $1,000 a month, and I put a lot of work into buying these homes. It takes a while to identify them and uh, to get, a right, get the right house and put the management team in place and all the paperwork involved for the lender. And I just saw that there had to be a more efficient way of buying property. Uh, and simultaneously, I was ready to leave my advertising job. When you leave your job, as you know, you don't have a W-2 anymore, and now you can't get approved for any loans. So I, I couldn't really buy any more single-family homes anyway unless I got really creative, and I just didn't want to go down that path. So I started studying how to uh, underwrite and evaluate multifamily properties. I also was talking to some people who were interested in the class I was teaching on single families, but they're like, you know what, this is single-family stuff you ever do larger things, let me know. I'd be interested in partnering with you. I heard that from two people. I was like, wait a second. Do I have a customer base before I actually have a product? Because when we have a customer base before we have a product, that's the best business to be in. I realized, I was like, well, I think I have customers. I think I have investors who want to invest with me and I don't even have a product yet. So I need to go find a product. I, start, I was studying multifamily and uh, then I ended up getting my first deal about eight months after I started studying it. And that was July of 2013. Since then, oh, I then waited two years and then since then I bought three more properties with another one under contract right now. Wow, so you went first from, you had four single family homes, is that right? Yes. And you jumped from that right into multifamily, right? Went from four single family homes to 168 units. 
Wow, very impressive. <laughs> and so many people, when they start out in investigating real estate investing, the first thing they kind of learn is wholesaling. And then they learn, okay, from wholesaling, you can mm -hmm. go to being the fix and flipper. And then once you get that kind of big, then you move on to apartments. Or I love what you did. You went, just jumped right into the multifamily because you're right. Growing wealth at $250 per house per month and all the work is not exactly a quick path. That's okay. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. If you want to keep doing that, if you could add one of those every month, or every couple months, you'll get there. You'll grow your wealth. But I love the way you think, how you think big. And how fantastic that you had investors before you had the deal, probably because you weren't afraid to talk about what you were doing, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And and to to what you mentioned earlier about how the the normal progression starts with wholesaling, then you work your way up. One book that was really influential on me is uh, Things I Wish I Knew When I Was 20. It was written, I haven't read it in a while, but uh, one of the points sticks with me to this day. And the author is a, um, a professor at, I think, Stanford. She was talking about how she created her own jobs, her own company, right out of college. I forget what the company is, that's not important, but she had her business cards printed, and she, she had her title as president. She showed that to her dad, who had been working in a traditional industry, climbing the corporate ladder, old school style, and getting you know getting a, a raise every so often, getting a promotion every three four years uh, of three percent, whatever whatever what the standard was. He looked at her business card and he's like, "You can't be a president of anything. It's taking it's taken me my whole lifetime to become a vice president at my company." And what clicked with her is that we can either wait for people to appoint us to the level that we can achieve or we can self-appoint ourselves uh, to the level that we want to achieve and then just rise to that level through resourcefulness and listening to podcasts like yours and just getting it done. And I think that's important because so often we get caught up in what don't we have access to what steps of the process am I unfamiliar with? When in reality, if we surround ourselves with the people who we need to surround ourselves with who are doing what we want to do, and we just take consistent action every single day, uh, you, know, you mentioned I'm, I've got the podcast. It's nobody else on the face of this earth was doing a daily real estate investing podcast. Nobody on the face of the earth. Uh, and I was like, you know what? Everybody is sane. I'm insane to do this, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it every single day. I've been doing it for almost two years now. And the business opportunities as a result of that have just, uh, it's, it's, it's reached a tipping point for my business in particular. Uh, and that's the type of stuff where, you know, we don't have to have, we, we don't have to follow the traditional path of others. Uh, we can simply appoint ourselves to where we want to be and then figure out a way of making that happen. I love that. And so many people I meet in the real estate education and club world where people are learning and they're coming up and asking me all kinds of questions. People are so afraid to put themselves out there and get started, but you said it. It's about surrounding yourself with the right people, having resources, having mentors, having places to go to ask a question which is so much better than just being frozen with fear and taking no action mm -hmm. and just studying real estate investing for years or decades. And I know people that do that. So yeah, it's all about action. Yep. All right. Well, what I'm really excited to get into today that we haven't discussed on my podcast yet is raising money. And I know you're quite an expert at that as you just led us a little bit into that, that you had people coming to you interested in putting money with you and investing with you before you even had anything for them to invest in, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I was, I was talking to them about what I was studying. Quite frankly, I was studying it. I was in I was an academic. I wasn't even practicing it because I'd only bought single family homes and only four of them at that. But I had established the track record with them from a trust standpoint. I had enough you know, life experiences. I, I built enough rapport with them just through life 
And then I, then they were, they were asking me to, um, you know, if I, if I was going to do something larger to let them know and in order to raise money, whether you know, my, my business is multifamily syndication, which basically means that I buy apartments with investors and we share in the profits. So I, I have, uh, as you mentioned, fit, I control $54 million worth of real estate, mostly apartments. And I have a 296 unit under contract as of two days ago. We're scheduled to close in September. And I find out either later today or tomorrow if we are awarded, if we're being awarded a 270 unit. So I'm actively, actively making things happen on the multifamily syndication front. So what, I, what I'm about to say comes from a place of not only past experience, but I'm currently doing it right now. I had an investor call two days ago where we talked about the, the, um, the deal that I'm working on. So um, what I, what I uh, would like to say to help anyone, whether it's multifamily or fix and flippers, when you're looking to raise money or partner with people on deals, first, you've got to know uh, that you have rapport with them, that you have built enough tr uh, trustworthiness with them uh, that it will that they will invest their dollars with you. That's the first thing because people would rather not lose their money than make money. It's mm. been time and time again, study and study, that if you give someone a choice, would you like to um, uh, lose five dollars? What would be worse, losing five dollars, uh, or would five dollars be better than losing five dollars? Something like that. I might have butchered the study, but. You don't want to lose money first, then you want to make money second. Uh, the second thing, so once you have trust, the second thing that you want is experience. So if they trust you, great, you got the credibility. That's quite frankly one thing that my podcast does. It establishes credibility with people even when I'm sleeping because they're listening to the podcast at all hours of the night. Um, once you establish that, then you got to know what you're talking about. You got to have the experience. If you don't have the experience doing what you are talking to them about, then you better be surrounded with uh, people who do know uh, what they, uh, or do have that experience. You've got to know the, the business, but you can't help it if you weren't around in 2008. That's something that I've heard from uh, someone where it's like, well, you know, you, I'd rather work with people who were around in 2008. Well, I wasn't, I can't change that, so I, I'm not worried about that. How I uh, respond to that is I have people on my team who uh, have the experience within that time frame in 2008 whenever the, the sky was falling but then also uh, we talk about the business plan of okay if something like that were to happen then this is the approach that we take we are anticipating something like that to happen but um, if it doesn't then uh, we're even better off for it so the second thing is experience. First, trust. Second, experience. And then third, alignment of interest. That's the third key whenever you're raising money. You've got to be able to speak to the investors and tell them, I like this deal so much that here are the ways that I'm aligned with you on the deal. Because it's one thing to say, hey, you know, great, great opportunity. You should do it. Uh, it's another to say, great opportunity. We're all doing it together. And there's a lot of ways to have the alignment of interest tactically. Uh, you could partner with a property, and I'm talking apartments, but I'm sure this can be applied to single families uh, or small multis. Uh, you could partner with a property management company who has that experience, which would help you in the second part, and they could bring money to the table. So they're investing in the deal. There's alignment of interest. That's awesome. Uh, additionally, you could have them not only put money in, but then bring their investor money in, which is another layer of alignment and adding uh, uh, the, the experience level because you're bringing in the property management company. Tons of different ways, but you've every deal that you ever bring private money for, you've got to have rapport, you've got to have experience or surround yourself with people experience on the deal, and you've got to have alignment of interest. Awesome. Very Excellent points. I love it. So what are the, the legal aspects of raising money that you can share with our audience? 
from a high level, well, clearly I'm not an attorney or especially a securities attorney, but from a high level, what you'll need is a private placement memorandum. You'll need an offer or an operating agreement, a, a um, investor questionnaire, and then a subscription agreement. And you can get those from an attorney, I assume. Yeah, you, you uh, securities attorney will draft uh, some of those up and a regular attorney can draft some others. And what each of them are really quickly, uh, it's a private placement memorandum, also known as a PPM, states all the ways that the investors are gonna lose their money uh, and then some. I mean, it's just like Armageddon is happening and here is every scenario since the beginning of time that has happened where investors have lost money on these types of transactions. So if an investor is not familiar with the private placement memorandum or is investing for the first time and seeing this, it, it is a quite a scary document for them to read. It's like 150 pages long. That's the first thing. Second is the operating agreement. That operating agreement outlines how the LLC or the entity that you're buying the property uh, is operating. So, you know, just like typical operating agreement for an LLC, who gets paid when, what's the pecking order, what are the voting rights, all that stuff. The third is the investor qualifier. I only bring on accredited investors into my deal, which means that they make uh, $250,000 a year or if they're a uh, combined income with a spouse, I think it's like 300 or 350, don't quote me on that. Uh, or, or they have a million dollars net worth, not including their primary residence. And there's a couple other ways they can qualify too. Therefore, since I only work with accredited investors, they need to fill out a questionnaire to prove that they are in fact accredited. And then the fourth is a subscription agreement with basically states the amount of their investment uh, into the entity that we're buying the property with. Excellent. Well, thank you for that quick rundown. And uh, that's a really great overview. So here's a question. Do you know if um, investors, like, such as yourself, are you allowed to just um, post on Facebook that you have a deal and you have an opportunity for to, to come invest with you and make 20% return on investment or something like that? Do you know if that's legal or not? Uh, the answer is it depends. It depends on if it's a 506B or a 506C offering. There, I actually interviewed um, someone, uh, Mark, uh, his name's Mark, he's a securities attorney, and I, we, we went into that topic in detail. And the, the video is 506B versus 506C, which money raising structure should you do? Okay. Uh, from, a, from a very high level, one structure allows you to publicly advertise and allows you to publicly advertise in any capacity that you want. You could, I, I could be t selling my deal right now uh, if, if, uh, if my offering was the one that allowed you to publicly advertise. The disadvantage to doing that is you can only bring in accredited investors. Now, I mentioned earlier, I only bring in accredited investors, but there are also some other filing um, details and a little bit more costs and, and some other stuff, uh, as, as well as a verification process through a third party if you publicly advertise and you bring in accred uh, accredited investors only. Conversely, you can do the other uh, offering and you cannot share it with anyone publicly. You'll get in trouble with the SEC if, if you do. And that's the one that is more typical because it allows you to um, uh, work directly with the accredited investors that you know. And also um, there's not a, an ob uh, obtrusive or, or, or um, a pro approval process through a third party that is uh, cumbersome. And so, you know, it, that it, it allows the things, the, the deal to flow a lot smoother um, that way. So it, it depends on if you do 506B or 506C. And uh, if you Google or if you put in YouTube 506B versus 506C Joe Fairless or go to my website, you can check out that video on the video tab. 
Cool. Getting some advanced stuff here. I love it. <laughs> all right. A few more questions for you. First of all, where did you originally find investors when you first started out? And then where are you finding investors now for your deals? Originally, uh, I'll, just, I'll tell you all the sources on my first deal. I had 12 investors I found, uh, and the numbers won't quite add up because uh, off the top of my head, I, I don't think I'll be able to remember everyone and where they came from. But basically, I, I got two from the Texas Tech Alumni Advisory Board. I've been a board member for Texas Tech for the last like eight years. I, one guy I just knew from my flag football team, he invested with me. One a guy who was a high school friend, one of my best friends. Another who was a college friend and roommate, really good friend. Another who lived with me after college in New York City, who uh, ended up investing. Um, also, I three people from my advertising company that I worked at. Two people who knew my oldest brother and knew me growing up. Um, and I uh, think they're think that's the those are the big re, big um, referral networks uh, and then miscellaneous miscellaneous other places. Uh, so. The, the, the takeaway for people raising money is it depends on really your, your approach when you just meet people and get to know them throughout life. So as you've been going through life and business and personal stuff, you're either building a brand of trustworthiness and, and good character or you're not. And, you know, you know if you are or aren't. And if you are, then you're going to already have people who believe in you and want to help you succeed while helping themselves as well. Uh, it's great when you have people wanting to root for you and help you be successful because one, it makes them feel good too. They know that you'll remember them and you'll help them along the way as, as you rise up as well. Uh, I actually have a spreadsheet that I'd be happy to give to every one of your listeners. Uh, it is um, a spreadsheet that lists out 10 different ways to create a network for yourself, for investors, and then it has a couple tabs on it that um, help you list all the investors in your network, and you can then, um, then approach those investors in a strategic way, and here's how you do it. You uh, list out all the investors you know, put them in the spreadsheet, and you can email me, info, info at joefairless.com, uh, and my uh, team member Samantha will send you the spreadsheet. So info at joefairless.com. Get the spreadsheet and put the people you know in the spreadsheet. Then the, the one of the columns in the spreadsheet is network. So how you know them. You want to group the people uh, based on how you know them. So in my case, Texas Tech Alumni Advisory Board um, and advertising and flag football. I'll just use those three. My goal and your goal is to talk to one person in each of those networks, ideally the most influential, doesn't have to be, but ideally the most influential person in those networks, and then say afterwards, if, if it's okay to mention their name when you introduce yourself and the business to someone else within that same network. So how it would work is, um, you know, for my advertising, and I saw this play out firsthand in my, for my advertising company, a guy named Brandon was in my deal. And a guy named Matt was not in the deal, but he was, he was thinking about it. And Brandon said, yeah, sure, you can tell Matt I'm in the deal. I told Matt, hey, Brandon's in the deal. And Matt was like, oh, wow, if, if, if Brandon's in the deal, then uh, I know he's fiscally responsible. I'll check it out too, for sure. That it makes the transition and opens up the conversation a lot easier than if you're going in cold. Love it. Excellent, excellent advice. And I've taken that approach too. So sometimes I have a deal where I need more money or something and I will yeah. go to my existing investor and say, who do you know that might like to participate? And I even reward them financially, which mm -hmm. I don't know how, um, you know, what the laws of that are in each state, but that's a great way if you can, you know, reward your referral sources. So we're almost here to the end of our time, but I'd love for you to briefly talk about I mean, you're definitely the deal maker. You find the big deals that need a lot of money and bring in the deal and bring in the money and then you make money yourself for that. How much does someone make or 
what percent of the deal or how much money can you make for doing that kind of role, for fulfilling that kind of role like yourself? Get paid in three ways. One is an acquisition fee. You get paid that at closing. It tends to be anywhere between one to one to three to four percent. I've seen as five. I, I've heard about as five as high as five percent. Uh, our deals we get paid two percent of the purchase price. So um, you know if it's a ten million dollar deal, then we get two percent of that. That's at closing. The second way is asset management. Over, so that is paid for overseeing the property, the business plan, tax documents, getting those sent out, everything that's involved. Uh, that tends to be uh, a percentage based off of the income that's collected. In our case, it's 2% of the income that's collected every single month on the property that we get paid. And then lastly, you get paid uh, for the equity ownership that you have in the deal. Um, and that, that structure varies drastically from 50-50 um, to 70-30. Uh, and the catch is that, say it's 50-50, the sponsor or the general partner, uh, which would be my role, gets, gets so let's say, 50% of the deal, but you don't put in 50% of the money. Therefore, you're getting equity for putting the deal together uh, and not putting in a proportion amount of, of money that the investors are putting in. Got it, 100%. Thank you so much for explaining that. It's awesome. Well, this has been really enlightening. Love some of the advanced strategies that are going to be new to some of my listeners and students. It's fantastic. So thank you so much. Why don't you tell us um, what you're working on and um, if people want to learn more from you, how they can do that. Yep. Well, working on closing apartments. Um, got one under contract, going to find out today or tomorrow if we get another one under contract. Also working on um, the podcast, Best Real Estate Investing Advice Ever. And uh, feel free for you know everyone, like I said, you can get that spreadsheet. Just email me, info, I-N-F-O, at joefairless.com, and Samantha will get you that spreadsheet. Fantastic. Love it. And yeah, I highly recommend if you're listening to go listen to his podcast too. Great information. I admire your work ethic, putting that podcast out on a daily basis. That's a lot of work. So great. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much for your time, Joe. Really appreciate it. And um, I'm sure I'll be inviting you back for the future for the next steps. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks. Hey there, thanks for watching the video. Make sure you like it and click subscribe to get notified of more videos. And you can go to hardhatholly.com for a free download on secrets to finding great deals.